When big names talk, they talk to the BBC. Welcome back. Now, musicians and mountaineers, the twin passions of my next guest. These are some of Jim Harrington's most famous images behind me that have appeared in Vanity Fair, Esquire, Time, Newsweek, just about every publication you've ever heard of. He got his first proper camera at the age of 10, photographed the musician Benny Goodman at 13, and he's just published a book 20 years in the making called Climbers, which the Wall Street Journal described as a gift of beauty and grit. Uh, Jim, welcome here to the programme. An absolute delight to have you. Hi, and Matthew. congratulations on the book. It is absolutely sumptuous. I was going through it uh, last night and today. The obvious question, though, first. How can you shoot two such groups, musicians and mountaineers? Well, that's what a lot of people wonder. But, in fact, they're quite similar, the, especially the era of each that I photographed, talking about 1940s, 50s, 60s. They were kind of s groups that were outside the social norm. Rock and rollers in the 50s certainly didn't fit in with the rest of the, the, uh, the normal people. And climbers at the same time. These were two groups that were on the fringes. That's very interesting. Let's talk a bit more about the book, because, uh, as I said in the introduction, 20 years in the making climbers. Tell me more about why you decided to do it, how you did it, the difficulties of actually tracking some of these people down. Well, it seems like everything I get into, whether it's music or climbing or Italian cooking, <laughs> I seem to get into it deep in the history behind it and the people behind it. And so that's what I did with the musicians starting from very young. And in the mid-90s, I decided to start tracking down some of these climbers from the Sierra Nevada mountain range of California, which is kind of my home climbing range. And I knew there were a few people from the 1920s still left over, and I went after them having no idea that 20 years later it would be this gigantic project. And it's interesting, you talk about Sierra Nevada, you know, home, but this was, this turned out to be international. I mean, you, you went, you talked to Ricardo Cassin, didn't you? And that was in, what, a matter of days before he actually died? Seven days before he died, yeah. He was, he was dying when I met him. He was uh, having this fantastic Italian vigil, great, great, great grandkids. There he is. Um, yeah, you know, these people, a lot of times they don't speak English, and I don't speak Italian so well. So it's kind of a tender, delicate thing to come up into someone's home when they're dying and the family's around and, you know, honor them and photograph them at the same time. Incredibly difficult, incredibly intimate. I mean, Brits will recognize Chris Bonington, the explorer you uh, did photographs around him. But uh, I also want to ask you about uh, another of uh, the explorers, Gwen Moffat, because you describe her as a bit of a hero for you. Tell me more about her, because she is absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. She was driving a truck for the army near the end of the war in England and picked up a handsome hitchhiker one day, asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm going climbing. And that was the end of Gwen's army career and the beginning of... And she went off with the truck, didn't she? She went uh, off with uh, the truck. So <laughs> Who knows where the truck ended up, but she ended up climbing in the Alps and Oliver Wells and became the first female British mountain guide. And, you know, just a real proto-feminist bohemian, not following men, doing it on her own, which I thought was great. Uh, that's what I love about uh, the book. I mean, so many of the stories that are weaved into the, the pictures. But let me ask you a little more about the pictures, the composition, because you did it on 35 millimeter film black and white. Various formats. Various actually, formats. Yeah. Black and white and, and not in situ, so not on a mountain. T tell me a little more about, apart from the age, wh why did you make all of those choices? Well, I grew up originally inspired by seeing these iconic great shots of them in the Alps in their prime. But they're not in their prime. You know, youth and vigor are past these, these men. And some of them are 100 years old and like Ricardo Cassin dying. So obviously I'm not going to be climbing with them. But I think also kind of uh, seeing them as real humans for the first time, not waving an ice axe at the top of the Walker Spur above Chamonix it was an interesting way to see their faces. And we're just scrolling through just a montage of some of the beautiful shots uh, in this book. Uh, aside from the climbers, let's talk about your day job, basically. You know, your Vanity Fairs, Rolling Stone, Esquire, just about every publication, as I said. Uh, I want to ask you about the, the Dolly Parton 
album cover shot because that is so famous. There was a whole sequence of shots that you took. Tell me, I mean, she got in contact with you, didn't she, to, to, to do that? How did that a go? A friend of mine was in a rock and roll band with her cousin. And she had been going in and recording a few demos with them. She had done the butterf uh, Airbrush Butterfly album covers. So she was going back to her roots, mountain music, kind of rock and roll, hillbilly country stuff. And she wanted pictures that kind of represented that. So I got into the fold, put my portfolio in front of her. And, you know, I had all these fabulous Rolling Stones, all these pictures. But I happened to have a photograph of a dead possum in there that I almost pulled out at the last minute. It was a lovely still life. But apparently she was looking at the portfolio and came to the dead possum photo and said, that's who I want to do my <laughs> really? album cover. That's, that's rock over. You referenced the Rolling Stones. I mean, you, you worked with a roll call of musicians. I think we're going to go through just uh, some of your most famous iconic uh, photographs. Tell me more about the Stones, though, because uh, how easy was that? How difficult was that? Uh, because uh, some of them, are, they're, they're, they're quite intimate, again, quite relaxed in, in the photographs. There's one there on the screen that you managed to get. Uh, what were they like to, to actually work with? That one was later on. The first time I got to know Julian Temple, who's now a film director, but was doing more videos back in the 80s. I got to be friends with him. He was doing a video with them in 1989, I believe, and asked me to shoot stills to be incorporated into the video. And so that was the first time I photographed him. This time was uh, at Lee Von Helms's house from the band, and they were doing a record in homage to Elvis Presley's original band, two of the uh, members. In terms of all those musicians that you photographed, worked with, uh, who was the most fun? Who was wild? Ooh. Who was not what you expected? Well, Keith Richards was pretty fun. Uh, Carl Perkins was fantastic. Uh, I mean, wild, you know, I, I never left Carl's house without a plate of cookies from his wife. That's not uh, very wild. <laughs> no. Plate of cookies. Oh, wild. <laughs> there's wild, but there's more human and interesting stuff that happened. Too. I love that one there with, with the cigarette. Yeah, well, that was the first time I shot Chance him. photograph, was that? Both those. Well, you know, Chance is in there with uh, being there. I was hired to do it, and then you wait for the moment. As well as musicians, the shots around Morgan Freeman, the, the actor, are, are absolutely wonderful. And there was a, a great story that linked to that, because you, you went, did you not, to to the area where he'd, he'd grown up. His mother and father had been cotton pickers, and, and it, only when he became famous, became rich, he bought that land. Is That's that right? right, yeah. It was a magazine job, and I went down. I'm sure he's got houses all over the world. But he's got a place in northwest uh, central Mississippi where his parents were sharecroppers. And once he became famous, he went and bought all the land and has a big house on it. But the little shack where his mother lived is still there, and that's where this photograph, the close-up, was taken in his mother's bedroom. That's an astonishing photograph that uh, you've been able to get. Uh, you know, when you look at all of the work that you do, the years that you've been doing it, uh, which are the bits that you enjoy most? Which are the bits that you find dreariest, most difficult? Oh, just traveling and living out of a suitcase and uh, having unpacked my toiletry kit in about seven years. And the best years. bits? Best bits are meeting people that I like. Uh, I really try to gear my career towards the people I like. I'm, I'm not open for everybody. <laughs> so, especially in the music world, uh, I tend to gravitate And 35 millimeter, uh, so many of these photographs, but in terms of the advance of technology, how, how much does that change what you're doing, just briefly? Uh, you know, it's all silver nitrate, again, various formats, but yeah, I like the limitations. It's a bit dangerous with film. It's the, the digital is very easy. You can shoot a thousand shots an hour. Uh, I like the limitations, as it turns out. Well, you talk about limitations. The book is wonderful. Jim Harrington, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me. Thank you so much Thanks for, for your time. Me. Thank you. Just before we break, let me take you back to Zimbabwe show you the live pictures from there because we're still waiting to see the former vice president. Uh, the crowds have gathered and uh, there is much, much anticipation. We're back with much more in a moment or two.